Hey everybody and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about some alternatives to functions in Rust such as macros and closures. So we've used macros a lot already. In fact, here's one right here. Print line exclamation point. That's a macro. We can also do this. That's a macro. Anytime you see this exclamation point, that's usually a macro. And you can see that this particular theme I've got in Visual Studio Code will populate it as yellow. What's happening here is this is actually its own sort of function that when it's compiled by Rust, it will write other code. So like when you have a function that's defined like this one here, like this what's up function, this is explicitly laid out and compiled by Rust as is. That's why you have to d provide data types when you pass variables in. When you return stuff, you have to provide data types. That's because this is all explicit and Rust reads it as such. However, when you use macros, Rust does a lot of like taking a look at how you're using them and what values you're passing in and things like that. And it like automatically creates code that's then compiled as part of your application. So what does that look like? Well, we've got the vector macro up here that we've seen a few times already. So let's just write that out here in, in raw form. We'll see what this looks like. And again, just so you know, I'm in the sum lib library from the last tutorial, because typically like we saw with the Solana source code last video, you want to put your macro definitions in some kind of library. So this is how you create a macro. You're going to use this macro export annotation. And then this keyword macro rules, which is actually another macro, oddly enough. And we'll call it vec, because we're going to just create the vec macro. And what this looks like is kind of tricky, so I'm going to type it out and then we'll break it down. So in here, we're going to have this parenthesis, dollar sign and another parenthesis, dollar sign x expr, comma, asterisk, and then that's going to return inside the curly braces, more curly braces, which is a scoped block. And I promise I will go through this. It's going to be a little bit to unpack at first. We'll create a new temporary vector. And then we're going to generate some code here. That's going to just do temp vec push. And it's going to be that X key. And that can occur more than once. And we'll return temp vec. And of course we need a semicolon there. So that right there is how the vec macro is written. Now there's a lot happening here. So I'm going to copy this and we're going to walk through it all step by step. So first things first is we're going to make this macro available elsewhere. It's in our lib folder. It's in our lib dot rs file so we're obviously going to be importing this just like we saw we did with the what's up function with the nothing much function we want to make this macro available to the rest of our program or any program that imports this library so that's what this is doing now here we're going to actually use macro rules to establish the name of the macro macro rules tells us that this thing is a macro and here's the name and then we enter the curly brackets. Sweet. So now once we get into the curly brackets, this is where the complicated stuff starts to occur. Like you can see, what are all these parentheses and dollar signs, like asterisk, what is going on? I'll try to explain this as simply as possible. First off, we're gonna match any Rust expression. And that's occurring here. This is representative of any Rust expression that could possibly be passed in. So that's represented by that. And at the same time, on the same line, we're going to allow one or more of them. And that's being done here. So this parenthesis representation, these dollar signs mean evaluate. And if you've ever worked with Linux or Bash, like you're kind of familiar with what these do, but it's very, very similar in Rust. It's going to evaluate this expression in here. And 
This right here means you can possibly have more than one. So when we use vec up here, we provided two values. Each of those values is going to be this. And so Rust will say, okay, well, we're obviously going to create this block here, this expression, and we're going to pipe in however many expressions that we have defined up here. Okay. Now here we're obviously going to create a temporary empty vector. Pretty straightforward. We've seen this operation before. New vector, temp vec, empty. And now down here, again, we see that dollar sign evaluate keyword or, or symbol. And so we're going to generate this command for all expressions. And that command is simply going to be push, right? So we've created a new vector that's empty and we're pushing in each of whatever we got into this temp vector. And then we're going to return it. Now the asterisk appears here again because this can occur more than once. And actually these blocks right here and right here are correlated to each other. So in the case of like our vector up here, if we got one and two, this is what that would look like. I'll go down here and I'll just represent it as like a block. This is what it's going to look like. So we get our temp vec. That stays the same, but then below it, we get temp vec push and we would push in one and we would push in two and then we would return temp vec. And that's what it looks like when we pipe in this one and two up here. And as you notice with this particular implementation, it operates regardless of type. So if we go ahead and do this and we make these chars instead, it still works. There's no error. There's no nothing because no matter what we pass in here, it's going to allow it. And that's exactly how it's defined, right? Just expression. Pretty interesting. Now we're going to take a look at building our own macro. Now, actually, I just realized after thinking about this, that if I was to keep these in lib RS in our sub lib folder, this might confuse people watching some of the previous videos. So I am going to actually slide this over and I'll just put it over in its own file here. So I just put that in macros1.rs in the intermediate concepts folder. And to create that file, we're actually going to go into main RS here. And now, like we said, we're going to create our own macro. This one, we're going to create a hash map using a macro. So we'll do the same thing. Macro export. Even though we're in the same file, I'm still going to provide that just so you guys know how to include it in a library. Macro rules make map. And then our syntax is going to look a little bit different than our previous one here. So we started with this parenthesis enclosed argument, and then we had this evaluated parenthesis as an expression and one or more of them. Whoops. So instead, what we're going to do is this time we're going to take in one like iteration of values. Like we're going to have two values, a key and a value but we're only going to be able to pass in one at a time. Like we're not going to have like a whole array or what have you. So I'll show you what I mean. We'll do K, the XPR and V the XPR. And that's all we're going to have as entries. So to make this macro work, all you're going to do is something like this and I'll just copy it in for you guys. And this is how we're going to run our vector, our macro here. So we're going to pass in a key and a value and regardless of type, we're going to get a hash map back that's going to have one key and one value. So to implement this, we already set up the inputs here. What we're going to do is I'll do like a couple of fancy things, right? I'll do like a couple of print lines, right? And then we're going to let mute map equal hash map new. And of course we have to import the hash map which is just going to be in collections hash map. And now we're going to go ahead and do map dot insert. And that's going to be dollar sign K and dollar sign V. And we're going to return map. Now let's run that. And there you go. We successfully got our hash maps created both times, no matter what type we used. Now, what about if we wanted to step things up a little bit? and then take like more than one input, right? Like if we try to input more than this, nothing's going to 
you know, be able to go through there. It's going to give us errors. Well, let's implement a hash map that looks like this. Let's implement a macro that'll let us create these inputs where we're using the bracket again. So array type syntax, and we're just going to have a bunch of tuples where it's going to be key and value. So let's go ahead and build that. We'll copy this and we'll call it make map two. And now here's where we're going to change a few things, right? So our inputs are first of all going to change. We're not just sending in one key value set anymore. We have to accommodate for like a whole skew of them. So whether this is an array or what have you, and they're going to be tuples. So to represent that, all we have to do is add our evaluate each syntax again, just from the, like the last one, right? So the comma asterisk, and that's what we saw here. Evaluate each of these. So we added that, and now our input is also going to be a format tuple. So we're going to add one more set of parentheses there, and then we should be good to go. Now our inputs are all set, but what about our functionality? Obviously this whole expression has changed from being one input that could possibly come in to being multiple. So we have to sort of like loopinize it, which is a word I just coined. So we'll pull this back up to the top and then we'll take this whole thing and we're going to just enclose it in this syntax like we've seen before. And that is what it looks like. So just add these semicolons here to be professional. But if you see all of our errors have gone away, and now let's go ahead and run that one and make sure we get the same thing. And yes, we do. Here's our ones from before. And then here's each of our keys and values being added. So you can see that that's how you write macros. And I know this is a little bit to handle, but if you just remember that this dollar sign is evaluate, this is more than one. And there's some other symbols too that I encourage you to look into. And then inside of here, you can represent how your data is going to come in. So now I've just flipped over to our intermediate concepts crate here from before. And I just created this main RS file here. And I'm going to show you guys how closures work in Rust. So I'll slide this down a little bit. And we're going to say closures example one. And for this, we're going to pass in, let's say, two numbers of I32. And let's return an I32. So now that we've got that set up, this is a closure right here. We're going to say let new number equal, and then we're going to provide these pipes. Pipe X, we're going to open up a new block, and we're going to just print something. And we'll, we're going to multiply this stuff by two. So let's say multiplying blank by two and we'll provide x to that print statement. And then we're just going to return x times 2. And we'll put a semicolon here. Whatever you provide, this pipe is obviously going to get multiplied by 2. Now, since this is a multiplication operation, we saw what we did with generics and with traits to allow us to be able to pass different numbers in that are maybe floats, maybe they're integers, what have you. You can do that with closures but you also can have them be pretty generic. So let's write our implementation here. We're just going to say if number one is greater than number two, then we're going to run the new number closure on number one. Else, new number on number two. And now what's happening here is we are actually returning this closure. And that closure evaluates to a number. And since we're passing in I32s, we're going to get an I32. So everything checks out. And we can totally test that out here by just saying, okay, cool. Now let's go ahead and do cargo run. And you can see that we're going to get multiplying by three by two, six, multiplying six by two, 12. And that's because we're obviously taking the higher number and multiplying it by two. 
just a basic example. But you can see that this closure name simply just becomes a function name, but we haven't defined it with fn. And that's because this, like I said, is a closure and it's also limited to the scope that it's in. So we're inside this function here. We couldn't call it from down here. Like I couldn't say let z equal new number of one because it's not in scope. So that's one restriction is wherever you put these, like they're limited to the scope. But this is a really handy way to write like shorthand functions and to simplify your code. Now you can see that, like I said earlier, we've got I32s coming in and we're getting an I32 out. So Rust knows implicitly from our structure here, and since we're only passing in I32s, that this is restricted to I32s. But what about generically using these? Well, let's set up a new function and we're not gonna pass in or return anything. So let's say, let sum printout. Again, we're gonna pipe in X and then we'll do a print line and we'll just say printout X and then return X. And then down here, we'll do a couple more print statements and we'll actually evaluate this thing here. So we'll do some printout of one. And now here's the key here using these things generically. We've just passed in a number, presumably an I32. So if we go like this and we change this to a string, what happens? We get this error, mismatch types. Expected integer found string slice. But how can that be? We didn't tell it anything about data types up here. Well, the way closures work is Rust is going to pin it to a data type. So as soon as you use it once, that becomes binding. So we did this printout here for a one and Rust said, okay, this is taking an integer. If we comment this out, you can see that it's perfectly acceptable. So that's the one caveat is you can't dynamically change inside a function what your closure is going to present like result. You have to have the same data types going in. That could be tricky. And I advise you to be careful with that because of the fact that you don't declare it anywhere up here. It's a little bit tough, but these are pretty neat. They help a lot with like writing clean code and stuff like that. You can think of them as like functions with inside functions um, to some degree. But definitely flex your muscles with these and we'll see them come up again.